Okay. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Fine? Not fine? Great? It's Sunday, right? This I think it is. Good morning to everyone who is online as well. Uh, appreciate you guys being a part of this. Let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we will jump in because we got a lot to cover today. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get started. Lord, thank you again for who you are, for what you have done for us. Uh, Lord, thank you, God, for your word, and that in a world uh, seemingly of shifting plates, Lord, uh, your word remains steadfast. Um, we thank you so much, Lord, that you have given us uh, the privilege, uh, Lord, to steward it, um, uh, to teach from it, to learn uh, from you from it, to illumine our minds and to be encouraged and strengthened and instructed um, um, and that you be glorified. I pray that, Lord, that that would be the case this morning, that uh, all of the teaching, Lord, this morning uh, would glorify you and that uh, we would be renewed um, in our minds to see the world from your perspective and gain understanding from what you've revealed to us. We love you so much, Lord, and we give you due praise, for it's in your son's name. Amen. Thyra, Tyra, we are in Revelation chapter 2, uh, uh, verses uh, 18 and following. So last week, <clears throat> we had talked about, uh, we had an introduction to Thyra, Tyra, right? One of the smallest fellowships, right, that we are uh, observing um, as part of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Um, but they get the most attention, right? We talked a little bit about the culture of Thyatira, uh, just a little bit, right? And uh, um, how they're the smallest city out of all of them, right? And uh, that they have trade guilds and uh, things like that that you can be a part of. And those guilds are kind of how uh, you earned and made a living. And... In some of these particular cultures here, especially in the city of Thyatira, uh, some of the guilds that they had that people were associated with were uh, connected to certain idols, right? And so if you didn't uh, bow uh, to this idol or didn't acknowledge this idol, uh, chances are it would be very difficult to make a living um, as you had to be a part of one of these, these, uh, these guilds. So let's uh, go ahead and start off. We talked a little bit last week about the introduction of the letter that Jesus does throughout these letters itself, setting up the, uh, uh, the authoritarian intent, right, of who is delivering this. We talked about the Son of God um, and, and why that title is important and that uh, his, his eyes are like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. This goes all the way back to chapter one and even has some connection uh, to some of the other worldly beings and things like that in uh, the Old Testament. All of this was to underscore that this is indeed uh, from straight from the top, that John wasn't getting this from his, uh, his own imagination. Let's go ahead and uh, continue on to Revelation chapter 19, or chapter 2, verses 19 to 20. It goes, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray, so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I would hope to get through all these two verses. We'll see what happens here. So let's take a look here. I know your deeds and your love and your faith and servants and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Jesus begins to commend them for uh, uh, certain things here that they're doing, specifically within the city of Thyatira. Let's take a look at uh, some of these here, just some of these words. Uh, deeds, where we uh, get the word ergonomics from. This word is ergon, right? Deeds, work, labor, stuff like that. Okay. 
Um, it is used 176 times in the New Testament and is frequently used in the book of Revelation uh, not 19 times. Okay. We're just going to take a look at these right quick. No big deal here. Uh, we've come across this word concerning the saints before, as a matter of fact. Um, for instance, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, we've seen this. Uh, Jesus addressing the saints of Ephesus says this to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? The one who holds the seven stars in his hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance that you can't tolerate evil men and you put the test to those who call themselves apostles and they're not. We talked about this weeks ago, right? That uh, uh, Jesus commends the saints of Ephesus for their labor among the saints and particularly their labor uh, of uh, filtering out those who claim to be teachers, um, apostles, and they weren't, and they're not. Um, Revelation chapter five, or chapter two, verses five to six, again, um, the same uh, 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 fellowship here. Therefore, remember for you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first talking about the love that they were to have for one another. That love, uh, um, according to the, uh, to the uh, saints in Ephesus, was absent. And in Revelation chapter 2, verse 19, okay, which brings us back to Thyatira. Again, this is, de this, uh, this is expressing the detail of the quality of the work that Jesus knows concerning the saints of Thyatira, that he knows their labor, he knows their work. He's very, he has a, he has a, he's very uh, uh, cognizant of that. He also knows their, their love as well. Again, this love is uh, the Greek word agape, Right, that love that is expressed uh, for someone else for their own purpose, their own benefit, without expecting anything else in return. Jesus uh, commends them for this. Remember, this concerns the motivation of the work. By the way, this is the first time that we hear this from Christ concerning a fellowship. In Revelation, he has not said this about Ephesus. Matter of fact, he, re he rebuked Ephesus for this. And he does not say this about Pergamum or Smyrna, but Thyatira. I find that to be interesting. So they are particularly called out due to the love that they have for each other. All right. That's quite a commendation. So he knows their deeds. He knows their love. He knows their faith. Uh, this, is this, this word occurs over 240 times in the New Testament. Uh, this word is a noun, not a verb. This is not an action that they're doing, but something that they're, they're, that they're gazing at, that they're looking at, that they're hanging their hat on that they're convinced of. In this case, this is involving God's word, what God said concerning his son, concerning what his son did, concerning who they are. So we find that, that Jesus knows their deeds and the love, the motivating, the motivating act and the factor by which they do these deeds, the foundation of, of, of the faith, the instructions that they're convinced of. This is quite a this is quite a fellowship and service service well this word for service is diakonos um, this is uh this word is used 31 times in the new testament and comes from the word diako meaning uh, to run errands right to run errands to go back and forth to serve individuals uh, this phrase uh, 
uh, is used frequently throughout the New Testament. Let's take a look at uh, uh, some uh, some uh, some uh, examples here. It's used by literal servants of the time period. That is those who served in the house of a master or those who served in the house of, of a person uh, who perhaps maybe they were trying to work off debts or something like that. Perhaps they were poor. In John chapter two, verses five to nine, we see uh, some examples of this. John chapter two, verses five to nine. This is concerning uh, uh, the miracle at Cana, attested to be one of Jesus' first miracles where he turns the water into wine. And we see this word uh, used here. It says, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, draw out, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, they did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. And again, then the head waiter called the bridegroom. So we see this word used here as for literal servants who were either serving under a, a master's house or, or attendants, so on and so forth. Concerning the acts of uh, the saints of Christ, we see this in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. And Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you all. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many concerning the conduct of the disciples and how they were to act towards one another. Their example was to be Christ as he points to himself for the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. And as I serve, you should. Right. Whoever wishes to be greatest among you should be one's servant. I have the same, I have the same one here. Uh, con concerning governing authorities, we see this in Romans chapter 13, verses 3 to 4. Paul writing concerning the governing authorities. And how the and how the saints are to conduct themselves among them. He writes this. He goes, for rulers are not a cause of fear, for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister, literally a servant of God, to do you for good. But if you do what is evil. Be terrified, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So we would see that the governing authorities, according to Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes that the purpose of governing authorities is to reward good and punish the evildoer. So much so that Paul writes that that 
governing authorities are servants of God, ministers of God. Boy, that's real relevant today, ain't it? That people don't recognize that. And we get uh, uh, the due consequences for that. We have that going on a lot lately. That's as far as I'll take it. <laughs> there is no re reverence, no reverence from uh, those who uh, are uh, bashing authority, nor is there reverence uh, as in our uh, enlightened statesmen to understand their position. Yeah, I'll stop there. I'm gonna get on my soapbox. Don't, don't let me get on my soapbox. Concerning the saints, Romans chapter 16, verses one and two, talking about the sister Phoebe. I commend you to our sister, Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, who is a Chetria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. For she herself has also been a helper of many, and of myself a helper as well. Phoebe is, is called out by uh, uh, Paul as a, as a servant, as we should all be. Servants of one another, assisting, helping one another. As Paul uh, praises Phoebe in this particular um, uh, this particular uh, account here in Romans. Concerning the servants of the saints, this is this is fascinating. First uh, Timothy chapter three, verses eight to ten tells us of a function within the body of Christ. It says, deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, talking about the, the functions found within the body of Christ. Elders, Paul starts off with first, concerning Timothy, and then deacons. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sore gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. We see this, this function within the body of Christ that deacons are, are ministers of mercy, serving the body of Christ physically. And reminding the saints that they are serving concerning the word of God and the gospel of Christ. What a high honor to, to serve in this position. Because again, these are, are people, men who, are, who have been purposely uh, chosen to serve in this capacity to extend compassion, mercy to those who are ill, infirmed, Things of that nature. So Jesus tells them he knows their deeds. He knows their love, their faith, and their service to each other. That they are, they are, a, they are a committed, loving uh, 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 group of believers who support one another, pray for one another, care for one another. All of the one another's that, that are listed, it appears that they are excelling at. And then perseverance, this word again is hupomene. We, we, we've talked about this before. It means to, re, to remain under, to stand. A better word is to, uh, to translate it as endure. So even throughout all of this, they are, they are enduring as well. Again, we've come across this word before. Now, I don't know what happened to this one. What happened to this one? <laughs> it's kind of weird. We've come across this word before. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, concerning the account of John. He starts off, uh, John, Writing in his introduction in chapter one, I, John, your brother 
and fellow sharer or fellow partaker in the tribulation and the kingdom and the perseverance in Jesus, right? And then he, he gives his detailed account. Jesus in the message to the saints of Ephesus says this as well, that they he knows their deed, their toil, their hard labor and their perseverance. The fact that they're standing up under enduring um, suffering and hardship. This would make sense, right? Considering if they are a guild culture and if they have idol uh, worshiping uh, guild cultures and a person has a certain trade or a certain craft and they can't be a part of that if they're not going to uh, bow the knee to whatever idol that they're worshiping under that guild, right? It would be difficult for them to uh, get work and labor as a result of it. And yet, and still, they are enduring up under that also. And that your deeds of late are greater than that at first. There is the words in the Greek language and my translation. And the work of you all, all the last is is many or greater than uh, of the first. This includes all things Christ mentioned, all of the work. So they are they are excelling in this. What a praise, right? What a praise. Look, I know your works. I know your love. I know that you guys are committed to uh, 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 the instruction I've given you and the service that you guys have together and that you guys are enduring and you guys are even doing it greater than you did at first. All of these works that you're doing. Jesus highly commends the saints of Thyatira concerning their motivation the quality of their work, how they are convinced of the promises and the word of the Lord Jesus and the quality of the work and all of the things associated with it is even greater than what they did at first. That's a pretty high praise, especially them being the smallest city, right? Not, not real prominent amongst the great cities, but even still they are committed to what God has told them, and they're committed to one another. That's pretty neat. Now let's get down to uh, the transition here. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess hmm. and leads and lead and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray. Hmm. Well, let's see here. Tolerate. What is this word uh, tolerate that you tolerate this woman Jezebel? I thought we were supposed to be tolerant. What does that mean to tolerate? Well, the word uh, is a femi. We've looked at this word before, as a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the book of Matthew, right? This word, uh, and we looked at the parable of the unrighteous steward. We talked about this word here, or the unforgiving steward, rather, not the unrighteous, but the unforgiving one. Tolerating uh, is the word of femi. This word has many usages. Uh, it is uh, it could be to send away, uh, to forgive, to cancel, to remit, or to permit or allow. Okay, we're going to take a look at a couple of verses here. Let's uh, go to Mark chapter ten. Kind of uh, get the feel for this. Mark chapter ten, <clears throat> verse fourteen. I'll start at verse 13. 
It says, and they were they and they were bringing children, that is the crowd, to them, so that he might touch them, and bless them, that is the children. But the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, "Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom." Of God belongs to such as these. Right? Truly I say to you, um, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all, right? Or won't enter it, period. Right. So this word permit, allow, allow the children to come to me. Right? Don't stop them. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't hinder them. Don't uh, uh rebuke them from doing that. Allow them to come to me, right? Uh, how about Luke? Luke chapter nine. Luke chapter nine. Verse sixty one. I'll start at verse fifty seven. So as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, uh, the foxes have holes um, um, and birds of the air have nests. But the son of man has nowhere to rest his head. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere uh, the kingdom of God. Another said, uh, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So again, we see this word used several times here to permit. Permit me to do this. Allow me to do this, if you will. Right? Allow me to go on and do this, if you will. And uh, Jesus gives them the answer to that. Hebrews 6, let's turn there and see what we can find here. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. It says, therefore, leaving... The elementary teachings about Christ, let us press on to maturity. I'm not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, of instruction about the washings and the laying on of hands um, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits or if God, God allows, right? We're not, we're not, we're not against that. If God allows us to do that, we will teach on these, <clears throat> right? So all of these uh, usages here uh, have within them, in this context, to allow, to permit. This word is also used two other times in the book of Revelation as well. Okay? Um, in Revelation chapter 22, Verse, verses two to four. Concerning the saints of Ephesus. It says, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you can't tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not, right? And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you all, that the love you had at first, you left or departed. Right. Again, that word left underlined there is that word of femi. You, you, you departed. You canceled it. Concerning the two witnesses in Revelation 9, 11, chapter 9. We, we will get there sometime. Sometime. Verse 
Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues will look at their dead bodies, that is those two witnesses, for three and a half days and will not permit their bodies to be laid in the tomb. They will not be given a proper burial during that time. They will not be honored. They will be despised, kicked, hit, spat on, yelled at, desecrated, right? Much like we see in our cities in America. Did I say that? I said that. Yeah, yeah I did. In other words, they will dishonor these witnesses that have come to bring them the truth. We'll talk about that when we get there. <clears throat> in light of this word, Jesus is telling the saints that they are allowing, they're permitting this prophet, prophetess who is known as Jezebel. This is not uh, like a questioning, like a, you know, she could be right, but I don't really know. Maybe we should test it. No, they're, they're, they're rolling out the red carpet for them. Allowing them to speak possibly in their, in their particular gatherings. They're endorsing this teaching. They have bought it wholesale. They're permitting her to speak, to talk, to share her, uh, her teachings within themselves. That's the point here. It's not tolerating as in, you know, they're, they're standing at the bus stop and she's just talking. We'll let her talk. She's fine. No, that's like, no, they're, they're, they're permitting this. Yeah, she, I, I, she, she, she's right here, right? You, we need to listen to her. The woman Jezebel, Um, Isabel is uh, her name in the Greek. That actually sounds kind of cool. Isabel. Um, the word is only used once, and it's only found in this uh, this uh, letter here. So this is a special case. This is something going on. This is Jesus addressing something specifically that this uh, this city of Thyatira is dealing with. Okay, this is the only verse that uses this word, and this word is only used once in this text. Jesus uh, associating the word Jezebel or Jezebel with the prophetess, with this, with the queen in the Old Testament. Let's go and take a look at Jezebel in the Old Testament. Uh, Jezebel uh, was a, a woman who was married to the king Ahab. Right. And uh, she was a worshiper of Baal. Okay? Baal was a fertility god. Right. They would pray and ask for rain um, um, uh, to bring forth crops and fruit. This is one of the reasons why um, in, in, in Elijah's time that there was a famine. So I'm not going to bring any rain to you guys. You guys pray to Baal. OK. The nation of Israel at the time during Ahab by marriage of Jezebel or Jezebel, um, they embraced this God. This is one of the reasons why at the apex of the Battle of Mount Carmel, because they were endorsing this God. They, they were permitting and allowing this, this, uh, this queen to speak. And as a result, they were corrupting the instruction of the nation of Israel. Let's take a look at a couple of uh, uh, places. First Kings chapter 16. First Kings chapter 16. I knew I wasn't going to finish this morning. I knew it wasn't going I knew it was gonna, I knew it was going to happen. I knew it. There's just too much here. First Kings chapter 16, verses 31 to 32. It says, it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. This is Ahab. Uh, the son of Nebat, that, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, 
king of the uh, Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worship him. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. This is Ahab doing this. Ahab also uh, made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. He, and he, not, only was, he not only promoted the company, he set up franchises. How about 2 Kings chapter 9? Second Kings chapter 9, verse 7. I'll start at verse 6. That he arose and went into the house and he poured the oil on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the over the people of the of the Lord, even over Israel. This is talking about uh, Jehu. It says, You shall strike the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the prophets of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. And then skipping down to verse 22, see, when Joram saw Jehu, he said, is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, what peace? So as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many, she was uh, deceiving and deluding uh, uh, the truth in contention with God's truth. And as a result of it, a whole bunch of actions and things that they were doing were contrary to uh, what God had told them, how to conduct themselves. So what's the point here? The point is, is Jesus associated Jezebel, the queen of Israel, who led the people of Israel astray. Uh, this woman is titled Jezebel who is misleading the saints of the body of Christ astray. This woman who, is a, who claims to be a prophetess according to Revelation chapter 3 or chapter 2 by Jesus is basically saying, look, uh, you're, you're rolling out the red carpet for this, this person who is deceiving you guys. So what are the cultural what are the cultural implications of the saints of Thyatira? Who is this Jezebel or Jezebel? Well, let's talk a little bit about who she is because I think it's important for us um, to understand this. This isn't just some uh, uh, person who's uh, uh, you know um, this isn't just some normal person within the culture. This person who Jesus is speaking of has extreme cultural significance. This uh, person goes by the name of Sybil or Sambithi. Okay. Who is Sybil, despite the fact it was a movie in the 70s? <laughs> Sybil uh, is, uh, this prophetess was more than likely a Sybil. A Sybil was a Greek prophetess figure who derived from the Orient, okay? That's where it started from the Orient and it moved and influenced uh, 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 Greece and Rome, okay? Most individuals were open to this sort of thing because they, they it would appear that according to the culture that this Sybil would bring uh, divine wisdom, okay? Um, it was historically conceived as one person, that is Sybil, but many Sybils or Sambithi were found in various countries in the known world. Okay, so they, they had various ones. Okay, so it, 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 it received its origin from the Orient, but as it grew, there were regions that had their own Sybils. Okay, again, they would set up franchises, right? Um, a Sybil would state her predictions by ecstatic experiences and pronouncements. One of the things that they would do is put her 
uh, put a sibyl in a mountain and she would breathe in poisonous fumes from cracks in the ground and from and then would speak ecstatically okay because she was being poisoned right duh but they didn't know that right they thought that uh oh she she's receiving some uh connection to 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 the divine here and so they would write down these uh these things and would prop her up as some sort of prophetess or some sort of uh of of guru Um, in some cases, these sibyls would prophesy and predict the coming of Jesus. Now, do you suppose why these individuals in the body of Christ are being persuaded? They would predict the coming of Jesus and mix Hebrew history and poetry with mythology. As a matter of fact, the scriptures speak of such a sibyl. The Oracle of Delphi, she's found in Acts chapter 16. Let's actually turn there. This is not a new phenomena uh, within uh, with, uh, uh, in Revelation. The Oracle of Delphi is a sibyl or a symbithi. Acts chapter 16. Verses 16 to 18. says it happened as they were going to the place of prayer a slave girl having a spirit of uh, divination that word is pathona or where we get python that word is associated with the oracle of doing her masters much profit by fortune telling after Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bond servants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her at that very moment. And then um, pandemonium broke loose, right? Because they were messing uh, with uh, with uh, them people's monies. But she is a, she is a sibyl. This is what a sibyl does. Okay. They were giving prophecies and all these things, and these people would be they would either use them for fortune telling, or they would go to them and get wisdom. By the way, that rendition right here is uh, this is an artist's rendition of the Oracle of Delphi. Two minutes. The oldest, uh, as a matter of fact, this was uh, retrieved from a uh, uh, some research that I was looking at. It says the oldest and most interesting of the Jewish parts of the Sibylline Oracles is Book Three in which the Sibyl is presented as Noah's daughter-in-law coming from Babylonia. Uh, this agrees with the tradition about the Sibyl Sambithi. So think about this for a second. This is not something off the wall that these uh, uh, people in Thyatira may be believing. This is something that uh, uh, perhaps maybe fits quite nicely with uh, uh, what they're being taught. Nevertheless, it is false. There was also a temple of Sibyl also. There was a temple, uh, there was also a temple that was dedicated to Sibyl. It was this place that the Sibyl would speak the words of the deity that she was consulting, that she would communicate to those who consulted her. What is, what is the point of this? Well, again, if the cultural considerations are the case, which I think they are, the saints in Thyatira are being persuaded by the instruction of the pagan oracle of Thyatira. They were being in, 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 they were being influenced by that. That's a big deal. Okay. 
Either they, they are mixing and matching Jesus's words with the, with the Sybil itself, proclaiming that she's a prophetess, or she's just coming into the fellowship and just kind of mixing it up with all of the saints, and they're promoting it. Either way, Jesus is rebuking them for this. So to sum up, Jesus is aware of the saints of Thyatira's works and their instruction. That's clear. Their commendation of their increased deeds, they are, they are doing more than they did at first. Uh, they, they were allowing and permitting the teaching of Jezebel in the oracle and an oracle of Thyatira. They were permitting this. And the last point that because of Jesus rebuking them, this places emphasis on the importance of the doctrine of Christ. This is going on in our fellowships today, folks. People are mixing and matching New Age teaching with Christianity. Hijacking terms from uh, New Age doctrines. Hijacking words and using them as if somehow uh, uh, that makes it more more palatable for people who are in that particular camp to embrace Christianity. Taking practices from New Agers and attempting to try to uh, wash them in Christianity, thinking that somehow that uh, that makes it more holy or more sanctified, uh, 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 just if you put a couple of verses on this practice. The same problems that the saints of Thyatira were going through are the same problems that we're going through in contemporary age. It's no different. And Jesus is uh, addressing this of the saints. Well, on to verses 20. We're not, we're not done with this verse yet. There's a couple of things that we have to clear up, though, but we will do that next week. Um, concerning uh, looking at Thyatira and some of the issues going on with them. Let's go on and pray, and then uh, um, we'll end this time. Lord, um, this is a clear case, as well as many other passages that we've observed in Scripture, to show that doctrine matters. It matters to you. It should matter to us as well. Because doctrine guides everything that we do and how we observe you and the people around us and what's going on. Lord, thank you for reminding me and all of us, Lord, to stay steadfast in this book. To realize that it is your word uh, that we should anchor ourselves to all the time and not to tolerate or permit doctrines and teachings that are Christian-ish or Christian-like or whatever the case is, but to be uh, steadfast, Lord, knowing that your, your scriptures are, are indeed life and truth. We love you so much, Lord, and we give you due praise. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Oh, no, no, I have to have to be